when I grew up in church, we sang hymns all the time. We didn't do um, the contemporary stuff that I actually love today. And that wasn't a thing that tells you how old I am and how the transition of, of church music and worship has, has, has gone, and I'm thankful for it. But when I grew up, we sang songs, um, and one that I remember was Count Your Blessings. Anybody remember singing that one? Count Your Blessings? Okay, thank you. And I love that. Count Your Blessings, name them one by one. Count Your Blessings, see what God has done. Count Your Blessings, name them one by one. Count Your Many Blessings, see what God has done. The problem is I think that we have the wrong definition of blessings. We have the wrong definition of what is a blessing. Now, I don't want to speak into your life, so I'll speak about me specifically. For example, I love crumble cookie. If you don't know what it is, it is these cookies. It's a store that that's all they do is cookies. And these cookies are like the size of your face. They are so delicious. And each week, Sunday night at 8 o'clock, they come out with the new cookies for the week. You can tell it's a problem, right? Because I know exactly when it comes out. And I've been waiting for banana cream pie. Literally, this cookie is like a pie crust. It is a little is a little banana cream pie. I've been waiting for it. I haven't had it yet. I've been waiting for it. It came out. And I remember when I saw on Sunday night at 8 o'clock, and it said banana cream pie this week, I'm like, oh, I'm so blessed. This is the week. What a blessing this is. And I was thanking God. Thank you, God, for this blessing of banana cream pie. And I went this week. I was able to go. And I happened to go on the sixth birthday of Crumble, where you could get six cookies for the price of three. What a blessing! I mean, I'm not kidding. I am thanking God. Thank you, God. This is a blessing. This is a blessing. Thank you, God. And I got three banana cream pie cookies. Now, one for my daughter, two for me. And I sat there in the parking lot, a crumble, and ate two cookies. Big cookies. Do not judge me. If you've not had them, don't judge me. And I'm sitting there, and I, I, I was like, I knew people were watching me, and I'm like, oh, oh, oh. I mean, I was like, it was my last day to eat, and I'm like, arr, arr. and then the blessing turned into not being a blessing. After two cookies, I did not feel good. In the hour drive home, I did not feel good. <laughs> there are times that we consider something a blessing, and it's really not. And I think we have lowered the bar of what a blessing is. Now, f- for you, we can all define blessing as being something, and th- we'll come up with a bunch of different definitions or things that constitute a blessing in our life. And again, I think what we've done is we've lowered the bar and we don't really know what truly is a blessing. Well, church, I want us, including me, to understand what a blessing is. Because God wants to bless us, but we need to understand what a blessing is to be able to live to seek it and live to receive it. So let me give you a definition. Let's go back to the Hebrew word blessing and what does it mean. And I guarantee you it's not going to come up cookie. All right? Here is what the Hebrew word blessing means. A blessing in the original Hebrew literally meant to kneel and implied a relationship between those who adored God and our God who benefits those who seek His presence. So, simply put, A true blessing comes, go to the next screen, a true blessing comes from a relationship with God and being in the presence of God. Oh my, boy have I taken blessing and watered it down to what I think makes me happy. Haven't we done that? Haven't we watered down a blessing and called something a blessing when it was really just a satisfaction or something that we thought was going to fulfill us, when in turn only God in His presence can fill us. A blessing is a relationship with God and living in His presence. That is a blessing. Count your blessings, name them one by one, being with God, being in relationship with God, and living every day in response to Jesus. That is a blessing. And we're going to look at what a blessing was for someone in the Old Testament and how that relates to us 
and the blessing that we have because of Jesus. Okay? So again, we're going to look at a blessing in this definition, kneeling before God, being in relationship with God and being in His presence, and we're going to see how that was fulfilled through Jesus Christ. That is going to be Psalm 84. I'm going to pray, and we're going to jump into it. God, thank you. Thank you that your Holy Spirit convicts us. We live for things. We pursue things. We think things satisfy us, things fill us. And God, may we be convicted by the truth that only you, only you can truly satisfy the desires within our heart and within our soul. Only you and being in relationship with you and living in your presence can truly fill us from a world that pours us out. So God, help us to receive this truth. Help us to live and grow in this truth. And every day, every day, kneel before you and worship. Kneel before you because you have chosen to be in relationship with us and invited us into life-changing experience with your presence. May your spirit speak. May we listen. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen and amen. Okay, Psalm 84. I'm going to start with kind of the heading of it because we're going to touch on that later. But Psalm 84 was for the director of music according to Giddeth. Now Giddeth, what that meant was this psalm was written as a song. Okay, it was written as a song. And it was written to be sung with an eight-stringed instrument. Very similar to what our acoustic guitar is today, even though it has six. It was very similar to that. So this was a song, but also a psalm, of praise to God. And it was written by, of the sons of Korah. We'll get to them in just a minute. Let's go ahead and read this psalm which is really all about truly being blessed by God's presence. Truly being blessed by God's presence. Starting verse 1. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty! My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young a place near your altar, O Lord Almighty, my King and my God. Blessed, get that? Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, who have set their hearts on pilgrimage as they pass through the valley of Baca. They make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. Hear my prayer, O Lord God Almighty. Listen to me, O God of Jacob. Look upon our shield, O God. Look with favor on your anointed one. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does He withhold from those whose walk is blameless. O Lord, O mighty, blessed is the man who trusts in You. Let's go ahead and break this down and see for the psalmist who wrote this, of the sons of Korah, how he was blessed. And then we'll see how, through Jesus, we've received the greatest manifestation of that blessing. So, to start, there are two blessings for God's people in the Old Testament under the Old Covenant Temple. Two blessings for God's people under the Old Covenant Temple. Now, when we say the Old Covenant, it's easy to think, okay, that is what they lived under in the Old Testament. That is what the descendants of Abraham, they lived in a covenant relationship with God. And the way they could be in relationship with God was God gave them clear instructions how to have their sins forgiven and to live every day 
being sinful people with a holy God. And that was through the tabernacle. The tabernacle is what God had instructed, first of all, Moses and the Israelites, and then it carried on to becoming the temple, which it stayed there in Jerusalem. But the tabernacle, the tabernacle, let's go ahead and see a photo. This is when they were wandering in the wilderness, and that's all the Israelites encamped around it. God gave very specific instructions for the tabernacle, and you'll see there, there is a place where there was a fire, not the big pillar of fire, but the fire, that's where they would have sacrifice of animals so they could have burnt offerings before God. There was also a place where the priests would wash their hands, and then you would go inside, and let's go ahead and see the next one, inside there is that first place with the candle and the, and the table. That is the candle. And there's also the showbread and the altar of incense. That's the holy place. And only priests could go in there, priests of God. And they were from a family, a very specific line. And then you see a curtain, and then you see the ark. If you watch Raiders of the Lost Ark, you're like, oh, yeah. So, so there's, there's the ark. And coming up from that, during the day was a cloud, and at night there was a pillar of fire. That is where God's presence was, the Holy of Holies. And only the high priest could go in once a year, and he had to go in with the blood of an animal, and he put the blood on the Ark of the Covenant, and God forgave the sins of the Israelites. Forgave their sins. So we sing about the blood of Jesus. Well, Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice, which we'll get into in a minute. But before Jesus, this is what they had to do. And only once a year. So then, David wanted so bad to be the one to build the temple. No longer a tabernacle, no longer a tent. But David wasn't able to do it. He, God gave him the design specific. His son Solomon built the first temple in Jerusalem. Here's a photo of that. So that would be a picture of what that would look like in Jerusalem, in God's holy city. Again, you have the place where they would have the burnt offerings. Then you go inside, and there again, that tall section, that is the holy place. That is where they had, again, the showbread. That is where they had the altar of incense and the candles. And then you have the holy of holies. Now, I share all this with you because this is important to understand this psalm and this is important to understand the true blessing God gives us when we are in his presence. All right? So, in understanding all that, we now go to who are the sons of Korah? Well, the sons of Korah were the gatekeepers. We saw the holy place, priests went in, only priests, the Holy of Holies, God's presence was with the people. Only once a year, the high priest went in. But then you had the outer court. The outer court is where you had the burnt offerings. That is where you had the labor, where the priests washed their hands. And right on the edge of that, right on the edge of that, was an entrance. That is where the sons of Korah were. They were the gatekeepers. They stood all day long at the gate. Because only God's people could go into the temple, into the outer court. So they had to be very careful of who was entering in and entering out. And the sons of Korah, one of them wrote this psalm. And when he wrote this psalm, he wrote this psalm from that service as the gatekeeper. Now, again, there were three people that served at the temple. The priest. Let's see this next photo. Again, the priest would go, they would serve in the outer court, the laver, and the brazen altar. Some would serve in the next place, the holy place, and they had to every day make sure the showbread was fresh, showbread. They had to make sure the candles were lit, the altar of incense was going. And then you had the huge veil, this huge curtain that separated, and then only the high priest went into the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant was. One day a year, day of atonement, with blood for the forgiveness of the people. So, that's what the priest did. And only from a certain line of the family. Okay? Only from Aaron's family. So then, 
you have the Levites from another tribe, another life family. They helped the priests and they also did worship songs. And then all the way at the gates, all the way on the edge, the sons of Korah. So it'd be easy to say, well, the priests were the most important. They had the most holy job. Then the Levites, oh, they're, they're pretty important. They helped the priests and they worshiped. And then you had the people in the background and we don't really recognize them, the sons of Korah. It'd be easy to do that. I mean, don't we do that in church? You go, oh, well, Daryl, he's so important. He's up here preaching. I'm not important. I'm nothing. I only represent the God who's awesome. And I speak what he puts on my heart and in his word. So it's all about God. It's not about me. Just as important as me are the people who welcome people. The people who serve with the kids. The people who run the sound booth. The people who clean. Those people are just important. Because the reality is, it's not about me. It's about God. And that was the heart of the sons of Korah. They're not back there going, oh, here we are. Everybody forget that. We're just the gatekeepers. And we're not as important as the priests or the Levites. No. Their response is, better is one day here as the gatekeeper than a thousand days in the tent of the wicked. A thousand days in a place of honor among sinful. It is better to be in the furthest place from the presence of God in the Holy of Holies than to be a thousand places else. They weren't ever looking at it as something where they were less than because it wasn't about them. And that's the first blessing we see. They were blessed to serve in the temple. They were blessed to serve in the temple. And it didn't matter where they served. Because it wasn't about the service, it was about the God they served. Unfortunately, the church today has allowed people to get burnt out and bitter in serving. Because for one, we don't take care of them and honor them the way we should. But also, we make it more about the service than we do about the God they're serving. And if you have been burnt out in serving, I apologize on behalf of the leadership. We value you, we need you, and we love you, but it's about God. So get serving. And if you're not serving, serve, because it's about the God we serve, and it's about the gifts He's given us to serve to honor Him. And it doesn't matter if you are a gatekeeper, or if you're a piano player, or if you're a sound booth person, or if you work with kids. It's about the God we serve, and that's what we see. Their blessing was not a part of anything else except they were in the presence of God. It didn't matter where they served. All that mattered was the God they served. Look again at verse 1. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord. How lovely. He's not saying, boy, it would be more lovely if I was a priest. It would be more lovely if I was a Levite and I was closer to the Holy of Holies. No. He was honored and blessed to be able to serve God. And it didn't matter what he did because it wasn't about him. It was about his God. My favorite part of this comes in verse 10, which I've already mentioned. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. Better is one day, one day to be with you, God, than to be on some beach in some sunny place because you are greater than whatever else is out there. I would rather be with you, God, than be a thousand places anywhere. I mean, we can come up, I can come up with some places I'd love to be. But it doesn't compare to being with God. Just one day is better than a thousand elsewhere. And then he goes on, and this is what I love. I'd rather be a doorkeeper. I'd rather be in the furthest place, the most kind of forgotten place, the one who's over, I'd rather be there than be in a tent and be in a place of honor of the wicked. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of the wicked because again, his heart, his service was about the God he served. And nothing, nothing distracted that. What's the first blessing that they had? Was to be in God's presence and to serve the holy, awesome God. 
The second blessing. The second blessing. They were blessed even in the journey to the temple. Even in the journey to the temple, they were blessed. Even in the journey. Verses 5-7. through seven, Blessed are those whose strength is in you, who have set their hearts on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. What he's referencing here is Zion is Jerusalem. And he is referencing those who live days and even weeks travel outside of Jerusalem. And according to the Jewish feast, God commanded the Israelites, the Jewish people needed to travel for certain feasts to Jerusalem to worship God at the temple. And so he's talking about the journey, their journey to God's presence. Their journey, and he's saying, blessed are those who journey to God's presence. But he also uses some symbolism here because that where he says the Valley of Baca, that was not focused on a place. That was symbolism because Valley of Baca means Valley of Weeping. So now he's not only talking about those who travel and make the journey to God's presence in the temple, but he's talking about the trials and hardships the times our heart is broken, the times we go through sickness and disease, the times we go through family issues, the time we go through all of these valleys of tears, these trials in life. And he's saying that God wants to bring a blessing through those valleys. And and we're like, whoa, why is there blessing in a valley of tears? See, the goal is is to grow closer to God. The goal is, the symbolism here, is to get to God's presence. But he's saying there's even a blessing in the journey, even in the trials. God doesn't waste a trial. God doesn't waste a tear. Because God does something in us through the valleys. God does something in us through the journey so that we can receive the blessing of His presence. When I was writing this, it made me think of a time, I've been through a lot of different seasons of weeping or valleys of weeping. We all have. We could sit and write all of them. Some of you are in it right now. But for me, one that I'll never forget is when we lived in Cincinnati and I went to Bible college. Some of you have heard this story. And I thought I was going to be a a minister right out of college. That's why I went to Bible college. Now, I met Jane. That was awesome. You know what I mean? Love my wife. And, but I was going to be a minister. And then God said, no, you're going to do weekend ministry. And then you're going to be a social worker. And you're going to have your heart ripped out every day for 10 years. And that's what happened. Every day. Got my heart ripped out. And I remember crying out to God. I mean, over and over again. God, why am I doing social work when you've called me to ministry? Why am I in Cincinnati when God, Jane and I both know you're calling us to Indiana? Why am I doing this job that's killing me? And why am I at a church in Cincinnati that I know I'm not going to be at long term? Why, God, is this happening? And I would have questions and go through just, painful, painful times because I knew this was not where I was supposed to be. But I look back now and that valley of Baca for me, that valley of weeping, that 10 years that saved my marriage and it prepared me for what was ahead. Because Jane and I both agree, if we did not go through that 10 years, through that valley, that 10 years of that journey, ministry would have either ruined our marriage or ministry would have then led us to not be in ministry today. Now that was our journey. I'm not saying that for everybody. But for us, we wouldn't have survived going straight into ministry. That valley prepared us, equipped us, changed us, and provided for us to be able to live in the calling 
10 years later. To live in a different service of God's presence 10 years later. Thank God for that season of 10 years because it prepared us, changed us. And the blessing was that we, we were changed in the journey so that we could then enter into that next season. Some of you are in a valley of weeping right now and you are asking God, why am I here? Why don't things change? Why am I going through this? And what I want to encourage you is God works in the valleys. And the greatest work is God changes us so that we can then enter into the next season. So rest. Let God do the work. Trust Him. I look back at that 10 years. Praise God for that 10 years. It was horrible. You ever knew that you were called to do something but wasn't able to do it? Sure you have. 10 years worth. But praise God because it prepared me. It changed me. And it protected me. This is what it says in verse 12. O Lord Almighty, blessed is the man who trusts you. May we trust Him in the valley. May we trust Him in the journey. May we trust Him as we seek His presence because there is a blessing in the process. Has anybody got an amen for that one? Uh, thank you. Thank you. Yes! Let God do the work. There is a blessing in the journey. Now, how does all this lead to our blessing today? We can definitely relate to those two blessings for God's people in the Old Testament. How does that relate to us? Let's jump in this. We're going to take this quick. Here we go. Here are two blessings through Jesus Christ. First of all, we have two blessings for God's people under the New Covenant temple. Now, the New Covenant is the covenant of grace through Jesus Christ. If you've given your life to Jesus Christ, you say, Jesus, I believe you are God's son. I believe you died for me and I receive you. I am yours. I live my life. If you give your life to Jesus, you are now under a covenant of grace and you don't have to go to Jerusalem to worship and have some high priest take the blood of an animal into the Holy of Holies because Jesus is the high priest and He is the Lamb of God and His blood covered your sin. Amen? Amen. That is the new covenant. That is the power of Jesus. We don't live under the old works because Jesus did the work. Okay? That is now our blessing. So what's that mean because of Jesus' sacrificial? sacrificial death and his victorious resurrection what it means is we are now blessed to now be the temple of God we are blessed to be the temple of God AD 70 the temple was destroyed there's a reason why it hasn't been rebuilt because the one when he died Jesus Christ when Jesus died on the cross, the veil that separated sinful people from the Holy of Holies where God's presence was, was rent, completely ripped in half. Not by man, but by God to represent Jesus just made a way. He made a way to a relationship and presence with God because Jesus, the high priest, he completely removed that which separated us because now we are covered by his blood we are completely redeemed. We are His children and we have a relationship with a holy God and we don't have to go to a temple to worship Him because Apostle Paul reveals where is the temple now? Here. There. There. We are the temple because God's Spirit lives in us. That is the power of Jesus. That is why every knee is going to bow and tongue confess because Jesus conquered sin and He gave sinful people who no longer have to go to a temple to now be the temple. Whoa, that's huge! That should change how we live. You are the temple now. Be holy as He is holy. Live in response and worship Him. Let's go ahead and look at this. 1 Corinthians 3, 16-17 and 6, 19. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's Spirit lives in you? I mean, we also talk about you don't have... This is a building, but you're the church. You're the church. We're the church. We can worship 
anywhere because we are now the temple of God. He says, if anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is sacred and you are that temple. And then 6, 19. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Who you have received from God, you are not your own. Smack in the face. You are not your own. Stop living in sin. Stop treating your body as if it's yours. It's not. It belongs to God. You are the temple of God. So everything you do should be worshiping God. We don't have to go to a temple. We are the temple. We worship God. Blessing means to kneel before God in relationship and response to His presence. That means as soon as you wake up, you're in the presence of God because the presence of God is in you, so worship Him. When you're at work, you're in the presence of God because the presence of God is in you, so worship Him. When you're with your family, when you're alone, when you're depressed, when you're angry, you are in the presence of God because the presence of God is in you, so worship Him. We live differently when we know who we are and we know the power of Jesus that completely rent the veil and now we have the very presence of God living in us. You are that temple. That's the first blessing. And some of us need to just let that kind of percolate a little bit. You need to put that in a spiritual crock pot and let that grow and look at your life and go, whoa, I need to live differently. I am the temple. And I need to honor the holy God who chose through Jesus to live in me. The second one is this. Remember the journey? God works in the journey. Here's the second blessing for those of us in Jesus Christ. We are blessed to journey to heaven. Amen. I'm tired of this world. This world is trash. There is so much... I, I sent out an a email this week because somebody hacked my identity and was contacting people in the church and saying, can you please send gift cards? That wasn't me! Don't you dare send gift cards! I will call you or come to you face to face and say, here's someone in need, here's how we want to help. They completely sabotaged my identity so that people could send them to California gift cards for their own selfish gain. This is an evil world. Praise God that this is not the end. Because this stinks. The end is perfect. No more sin. No more pain. No more evil. No more tears. We will be in God's presence. you want to see what the blessing is going to look like? The greatest blessing? Give your life to Jesus and wait for Him to come back and you will be in that blessing for eternity. And that is what we need to see. We are blessed to journey to heaven. This life is not our home. This world is not our home. The journey we live every day living for Jesus leads to eternity with Him. Let me read just two scriptures, and then I'm going to stop. We're, gonna do, we're just going to respond, because I can keep on going. JB, I can keep on going. All right. 1 Peter 1, 3-7. This is the journey. This reveals the journey. The inheritance, heaven, that is our home. That is where the ultimate blessing of God's relationship and God's presence will be. But we need to understand the blessing and the journey to get there. 1 Peter 1, 3-7. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by His great mercy that we have been born again. Because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, now we live with great expectation. And we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by His power until you receive this salvation. He's talking about eternal life. Which is ready to be revealed in the last day for all to see. So be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. This life until heaven is the valley of Baca. It is the valley of weeping. Because we are going through the trials of living in a sinful world, but those trials in this sinful world do not define us. Jesus does. In our home, in our inheritance, 
is in heaven. And he says, these trials will show that your faith is genuine. It's being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. Even though we must endure many trials, even though we face all of the hardships and all of the sinful world around us, the journey, the journey is heavenward because Jesus made a way. I'm going to close with this scripture. I'm going to pray and then we're going to respond with a song. John 14, 1 through 4 and 6. These are Jesus' words. This is what we got to hold on to. If your life stinks right now, guess what? Your life is going to stink again. Life is going to stink on this earth. And I like saying the word stink. I don't know why, but I'm going to keep on saying it. It stinks here. But praise God, we have a way maker who overcame this world and he is leading us home. And here is what it says. Jesus said these words, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you may also be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You know what? Crumble cookie is not your blessing. I'm here to tell you, your family is not your blessing. Your health is not your blessing. Your job, money, is not your blessing. Your house is not your blessing. A good crop year is not your blessing. A new car is not your blessing. Your blessing is a God who made a way for you to be in relationship with Him and for you to have His presence dwell in you as the temple of God and that you will be home with Him for eternity. That is the blessing. Let's live for that now. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, thank You. Thank You. We know how the story ends. We will be with You again. We know how the story ends. Jesus, You are coming back. And you are riding on the clouds with the trumpet blast of heaven. And you are going to take us to be with you in heaven for eternity. The greatest manifestation, the fullness of your blessing, God, is for us to have that reward. Your presence for eternity. But God, it has to always start and always end with Jesus. If anyone is outside of your son, Jesus Christ, may we understand the greatest blessing you've given us. Yes, we want to serve you. Yes, we want to be changed through the trials of life. But the only thing in life and death that matters is Jesus. Jesus, we need you. Jesus, you are our way maker. Jesus, may you be our blessing today and for eternity. It is in your name, Jesus. Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.